In fact, I was just talking to Peter Gray a couple of days ago. What are the prospects for larger scale change? Now he's actually pretty pessimistic about uh, about change at the system level. And so it's an interesting, you know, I think his observations are actually right on. Right on. Um, <laughs> he's, 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 you know, he, he's no dummy. <laughs> yeah. No. I mean, you know, everything he's like, he's been talking about the tipping point for a while and he's yeah. been talking about, right. Like, like, can we really make change at the, at the systems level? I don't know. And, and I think that I, I fight for that all the time, right? right <laughs> like right, I think right. we can, I think we can. And and realistically, I think Peter's right on the button there. It's 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 going to be uh, difficult. Yeah, yeah, and I, I think that that's the so so part of my work has been trying to think about that that very question of the the system change, and and then trying to find what are there historical examples that that point us one way or the other. Is is education is notoriously resistant to change like it 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 is like the paragon of of unable to change and and you know and there's really good solid you know cuban or cuban larry cuban anyway one of the guys one of the big historians of education wrote a wrote a book in the 90s uh, early 90s called um uh, how teachers taught and he looked at uh, so, so he wanted to get below the rhetoric, below the sort of f- froth of, of popular opinion and get it. OK, well, what were teachers actually doing with students between 1890 and 1990? And and, and because and, and what he's getting beneath is, yeah, you you heard about the progressive movement in Dewey and then you heard about, you know, the 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 administrative progressives. He was, a, you know, there's variations on the progressive thing. And then you have. You know the free school movement from the 60s and 70s, and 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 a whole bunch of kind of stuff going on there. And then you have back to basics, which going in. You know. His conclusion was nothing changed, nothing real, nothing substantial. Is that that there were trivial differences? They stopped bolting desks to the floor, so the furniture changed. Um, and today we can say, you know, oh now they've got computers, you know, and they've got smart boards. Um, and then he wrote a follow up. Um, just came out in 2021 called Confessions of a School Reformer. Mm. And he said, yep, still nothing's changed. <laughs> uh, 130 years and zero has changed. And and so it's 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 famous as a, as a field for its kind of resistance to change. But then it's like there are some other things that have been very <laughs> resistant to change too. So my my quest has been are there historical examples of of something so intractable actually changing. The the facile example that people often give is sort of Soviet Union and the breakdown break of the Berlin Wall and all that sort of stuff. But I think the more precise parallel is is actually that transition from miasma theory to germ theory. Is when you look at how resistant medicine was. The, the medical practice was to changing. It's really eye-opening. And then there's a whole book called Bad Medicine by David Wooten that goes into this. And and it's just, there, there's some, the, the way we think about it is, you know, oh, thousands of years, we all sort of, you know, thought miasma was the thing, you know, like, like cholera was caused by bad air. And then, and then, along comes you know pasteur and we all go oh it's all changed you know germ theory now go you know and and it's not like that at all it, it, it's just remarkable how hard it was because because actually you had a series of people um semmelweis doing hand washing and then uh, john snow and the and the cholera epidemic in london and and it, he was the first to really prove that it could not be the air. Like he had good solid data. He had he had not only the kind of basic who died where, which was the key thing, because prevailing winds would have predicted one set of data and then the actual the way it happened was not that at all. <laughs> but it was it the, the thing that really solidified his case was exceptions. Like this one woman um who died out in the countryside. 
I was like, wait, what? Why, why is that? Well, it's because she used to live in the neighborhood where it broke out. And she had her children bring her water from the well that was the source of the infection. And, and so it killed the whole family. Or, or there were a few children left. They were the ones who told the story. Um, but, but basically, they killed their mother and, and some of their siblings, the ones who survived and were able to tell the story. Uh, but there's exceptions like that that really proved it. And nobody like went, oh, okay. You know, like, it didn't work that way. It actually took decades before th there was a guy on the water board there that, that actually did end up going, oh, yeah, he was right. They changed the whole thing. So in 1860s, after Jon Snow had died, actually, so the, the 1854 was the outbreak of the cholera that he studied. 18, he died in the late 1850s, maybe the early 1860s. But 1864, there's a guy on the wa London water board who decides to follow Jon Snow's advice and says, OK. You know, and so they start building the first real true sewer system that's separated from the water system. Uh, so, so the the cause of it was putting sewage into the Thames River, which is the drinking water for two thirds of the city, right? Anyway, uh, I, I I love this story, so I, I it's shouldn't go on too long. But yeah. the, the, the gist is, the the people don't change easily, and we as educators know this. You know, the whole there's there's a whole thing about transfer. In, in education. Oh, how do you get them to learn here? That chance. Everything we know about how people's brains work is they do not want, it, it, the system is set up to not change, mm -hmm. but it can change. And so the challenge is how do we create those changes? And, and the, the, the key element of the story of change from miasma to germ in terms of actual practice in hospitals, because that's where people, a lot of people die there. Uh, a lot more used to die there, was that in the U.S., it was this thing called the Flexner Report in 1910, I think. Anyway, so so think about Pasteur and the people who were articulating germ theory were in like the 1870s. And then it's decades later in the U.S., they finally say this Flexner guy gets, it's a Carnegie-funded, congressionally authorized study of medical education. He goes to every medical school in the country, which is a few hundred. And, and he writes this extensive report. And basically it comes down to very few of those schools were teaching anything science. Science just wasn't part of the deal. Medical education was an apprenticeship, do what the old guy does and go. And so that was a great way to preserve the status quo. <laughs> So the Flexner Report and what Congress did to, uh, was they took control of the the certification, the, the accreditation, that's the term. Mm -hmm. They took control of accreditation of medical schools. And so they, what that caused was about half the schools in the country, maybe two thirds, uh, either consolidated or disappeared after that change. But what that meant was that now the remaining schools taught science, they taught germ theory, and but the hospitals didn't change until the 1940s. Okay, so another couple of decades. And that's when, because you had a generation of doctors now educated in this very specific way, then that generation of doctors began to bring in the change of actual practice. So it's, you know, if you think of Semmelweis in the 1840s, all the way to uh, what Wooten says is, the, you know, the, the real adoption of these things and things like, um, uh, uh, the first transplants were done in the late 40s. So that's when you had this shift. So 100 years from the conception to the change, to, to real change in practice, where, where, where the, the rate of death went from something on the order of 60, 80% being infected, and then over half of those people who got infected died. So you're talking about like a, a horrible rate, <laughs> you know, like 30% like death rate being trimmed down nowadays is just six or seven percent get infected and of those only six or seven percent die so it's a tiny percentage it didn't eliminate death it didn't eliminate infection but it got orders of magnitude better and that's what that's so that's why i think i have hope for the system and and really getting self-determination theory as a key part of that and and then and then the question is how do we educate a generation of teachers to really be able to understand it and 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 start to, in their own way, demand from the schools they end up in, the support they need 
for for doing it right, doing it right, not only for the children, because in some ways that's kind of obvious, but also demanding how do we support the teachers? How do we support the principals? Really seeing it as a, as a fully human system. This is the Agentic Schools Vodcast, where you will learn about schools from around the world where children's agency to make decisions about their learning and living is more important than their academic skills. What makes education possible is the satisfaction of psychological needs. So that is what these schools have in common with all others. What makes a school agentic is satisfying those needs particularly well. I'm your host, Don Berg.